Good afternoon. I'm not sure what happened to this side of the room. Maybe I didn't pay enough attention to them or something when I was talking. Most of them have decided to leave. Or maybe you just like the windows. You like a little bit of vitamin D. Who knows? Uh, today we're going to jump into control structures. Control structures are great because they allow us to do a lot more complex programs than what we've been doing. So far, we've been doing things that are kind of linear, where you, you execute a line of code and it just goes the next one, the next one until it's done. That's it. And there's only a, a limited number of things that you can do. Uh, you can't even really build a, a truly intelligent program without control structures of some kind. Um, there are two basic control structures that we're gonna introduce uh, in the next couple of modules. Uh, one of those is branching and the other is loops. We're gonna start with branching. Um, and the downside, the upside of course, is that, that we can make more complex programs. Uh, the downside is that we can make more complex programs. Uh, and I, what I mean by that is that we are going to have a, a, a noticeable but relatively small jump in the difficulty of the class. Don't panic. Don't run to YouTube and get the answer from YouTube. Don't copy code online. Remember, your focus in this class is learning how to be a good programmer and learning how to code, not getting through the assignments. If you just get through the assignments by copying and pasting, I may or may not catch it. It's really kind of irrelevant to me. At the end of the day, it won't really affect my life much, but it will impact your ability to not just program at the level of this assignment, but remember, <laughs> these layer on top of each other. So if you're lost now, it's not going to get easier if you don't understand this. So take the time. I'm here 30 minutes before class every time. Come in, ask questions, find out what you're missing. Let's talk through some of the problems you're having. Rather than going to YouTube or um, chat GPT or websites or whatever, to I mean, chat GPT can, can code every single assignment in this class. Yeah, it's great, but not if you want to learn how to code. <laughs> At some point, you will you will achieve a level of coding or challenge in your programming where ChatGPT is not going to be able to save you. Okay, and that is why we need people doing actual programming, and we're not all going to be replaced by AI in any time in the near future. Interestingly enough, my son, who I think I told you all is working in AI um, and doing research in AI, had a lengthy discussion last night about the biases in ChatGPT. I don't know if you've seen any of the noise on, online about this lately, but interestingly enough, um, ChatGPT is very biased in terms of its answers. And I, it, it, to be quite frank, it's biased in a liberal way. And most of us, some of us might be going like, yeah, that's cool, good for chat GPT. Uh, others of us might feel more nervous about that. But regardless of where you fall in the political spectrum or with regard to some of the things that are addressed by that, having AI that is biased is never a good thing. So it's interesting. We had, a, my son and I actually plugged in different prompts to chat GPT and some of them it refused to answer but if you gave it the opposite prompt it would give you a lengthy discussion and so it's really interesting to sort of play around and see see some of those things and even puzzle with some of those things on sort of a philosophical level like what do we what is good or bad about bias in AI and it's really sort of difficult um, there have been a lot of biases that have been discovered because the vast majority of programming has been done by white men. And when it comes to some things, that's okay. But when it comes to things like facial recognition, if I'm a white dude with certain kind of features and certain skin tones, and I'm coding, let's say, a facial recognition algorithm, and I train it using my face, guess what? When you come to darker skin tones, different facial features, maybe certain jewelry or things that are commonly worn across cultures, 
those same facial recognitions fail when they should when they shouldn't fail. So there's a real need for diversity and also inclusivity of thought in all of our AI and even in our coding. That's why it's so important that we have a diverse group of people. And I love looking at this class because it's it's a fairly you're a fairly diverse group. I think that's great. That's what we need in coding. We don't need a bunch of dudes who look like me doing all the coding. Not at all. But still like 85% of, of computer science folks and programmers and that sort of thing are still we're still very white, very male. It's not good. So so if if you fall outside of that category, good for you. Stick with it because that's important. So I'll get off my soapbox and, and get back to the programming part of this. But control structures. Very cool. Gives us a lot of complexity in our programs and uh, gives us the ability to do a lot of stuff. At their core, they're pretty simple. Let me show you an example of a classic control structure that I hope you'll recognize. Let me learn how to use my PowerPoint. There we go. This one. This is familiar to everybody? Sort of a classic. It's a control structure. It has a question or assertion that can be answered in one of two ways. And based on that answer, I, as the author of this note, may take one action or another, right? Because I'm asking for information. So if I was gonna code this in actual Python code, right? I might say, if you like me, equals true, then print ask you out, else print I was just kidding, right? Something like that. So this is how that control structure would look in code now let's look at the code and let's look at what we're, what we're trying to do here. How does a control structure work? So an if statement is the most basic of all control structures. It's a branching statement in that it takes the program one direction or another based on the value of an expression that goes here. It does not have to be in parentheses. I like to put it in parentheses sometimes because visually it says this is the expression I'm testing. Also, because I program in multiple languages and some other languages yell at you if you don't use parentheses, Python doesn't care, so I just use parentheses for everything. Then I have less thinking. Programmers are inherently lazy, just so you know. Everything we do is built to save us time or prevent further work in the future. So that, less thinking, more cycles for something else. So if something is true, and this expression has to evaluate to either true or false, the interesting thing here is most things that you do in a computer evaluate at some point at some level to true or false, whether you realize it or not. I could put the number zero in here and that evaluates to true or false, right? That evaluates to false. I could just put the key, the Boolean value of true or false, not lowercase true, but a capital. So this is the statement. This is what starts the branching process. The colon is important. Right there, as is the indentation of the code beneath it. Isn't it? It really oh, I love it. I love JetBrains. Yeah, I, I really, PyCharm is a great program. It really is. And if you've used other editors to try and code, you'll appreciate it. But it's kind of like, you know, the uphill both ways in the snow, walking to school thing. Like if, if you always rode the bus, you won't appreciate how hard it is to walk. But, you know, just enjoy the bus is what I would say at this point. Uh, so underneath the if, you need to indent. Indentation is significant 100% of the time in Python. If I have code that is indented and it's not beneath an if statement or another structure like this that ends in a colon, Python's going to yell at me. And some of you have had that exact error in some of your programs where you inadvertently put a space at the beginning of a line of code. Uh, so you don't wanna do that unless you're doing it intentionally. And everything that I want 
the program to do, if this is true, should be indented. When I go back out to the, the first level of indentation where it's lined up, then I'm saying that's like the next line of code. If this is false, it'll skip down to the next line that's not indented. Make sense? A lot of people get confused on the indentation, so try and be really deliberate on that. So finding out if something's true, <clears throat> most of the time requires us to use a comparison operator, and in most cases, Python will yell at you and throw an error if you don't have a comparison operator in the expression of some kind. The most basic of all comparison operators is the equal sign. We To test or to ask if something is equal, we use two equal sign. One equal sign is assignment. X equals five is saying X is equal to the value of five. With two equal signs, it changes to is X equal to five? So is it equal is what we're asking there. And if the answer is true to that, then it'll execute whatever code is in that code block. So is it greater than? X is greater than five. So if X is six, then it will execute that. Less than, greater than, or equal to. Less than or equal to. A lot of these should be familiar if you've done some algebra work. This one's probably new, all the way down at the bottom. Is it not equal? So this will give a true if the two values are not equal. And this is where we start getting confused because we're having we're working with double negatives at this point and a double negative is a positive so we're if it's if we're saying if this returns false then what it means is that they are equal or they're not not equal okay so we can get a little bit confused with our logic and this is a great place to remind you that the debugger in pycharm is really helpful if you put a breakpoint at the beginning of the line where you ask the if, then it'll give you all of the variables that right there, and you can actually check to see how it fits. <clears throat> you can even plug those variables into that equation using the evaluator and find out what's going on. So here's some scenarios. True or false? True. What about this one? True, yeah. What about this one? False, why? Yeah, because a lowercase b and uppercase b are not the same thing. What about this one? False. We got an int and a string, which are not the same. True or false? True. 10 is greater than 5. What about this one? Less than or equal? Yes, 5 is equal to 5, so it's less than or equal. What about this one? True. Yeah. 7 is, the int 7 is not equal to the string 7. So it's true that they're not equal. That's how I would say it in my mind to help me not be confused. What about this one? False. 7 is neither less than nor is it equal to 6. So that, that is false. This one? Mmm. That's a trick question. That will result in an error because we can't compare a string to an int. Also a trick question, just different values. If you have a string on one side and an int on the other, it's very difficult. Other than the, the equality uh, test, you have a hard time with, with making comparisons of those. Yes, yeah. Yeah, both of these would, because you can't really say. I can say that these are not equal. They're not the same. Equal or not equal, I can do. But greater than, less than, computer is not, not like those. So now we're going to get more advanced, and we've got what are called Boolean values here, as in Boolean logic. So logical operators are and, or, and not. And they modify a simple expression and make you want to bang your head on the desk sometimes. So on this one, x is greater than 2 and x is less than 10. 
somebody give me a number that would make that statement true for X. What? What's that? Anything between three and nine, right? Yeah, anything between three and nine. What about this one? There's It's an or. Right. There's exactly one number that will make this false. Everything else in the every number you can possibly imagine will be true except for one number. 11. Because 11 is not greater than 12 and it's not less than 10. Everything else is true. Okay, so what is this one? Uh, w by the way, if you're thinking, hey, dummy, wouldn't it be easier just to say x equals 11? Yes, it would. Now you're thinking like a programmer. So here we go. Not x equals 5. Not x equals 5. So what, what number would evaluate that as true? Anything that's not five, right? This is a fun one. I've taken this and I've put a not in front of it. So anything that's not 11, right? So why give you these convoluted examples? Because I guarantee you, as you develop programs, you will have all of these variables that you're working with and you're like, okay, I need to come up with an expression that will test us as true. And you'll start building something like this. And sometimes for the readability of your program, because you wanna be able to track all of the different variables or the different ways that it could not be true, sometimes it's good to leave it like this. Other times it's good to just say, X is not equal to 11. And that's, that's a programmer's decision, but whichever way you go, I think that's a really great place to put a comment, right? To say, especially if you change it to the X is not equal to 11 thing, just say, here was the original, that's too complicated, X is not equal to 11. That's a good time because that is the kind of thing, I, don't, I can't speak for anybody except myself, but that is the kind of thing where if I sleep and then I come back and look at it again, I will have forgotten everything about what I just did. So comments are really good to have. Let's make it more fun. I was gonna say more difficult, but I wanna be down on it. Let's make it more fun. So if this is true, then do this. Now we have else. It does, if this isn't true, then do this instead. Now again, If I have another line of code that's lined up here and I start another line, it will choose whether this is true or whether it will not. So it'll do this and then this, or it will do this and then this. Make sense? Because this is the next line of code to be executed after that. <clears throat> so, we want to be thinking about that indentation again because the indented code here belongs to this if, the indented code here belongs to else. So now we're starting to see that branching. But real trees don't just have two branches, they have lots of branches. So another way I can add another option to this is by using the elif statement. The elif statement says, if this is true, do this, else, so if this is not true, then go here, test this expression, and if that's true, then do this. And if none of these are true, do this. Ideally, we would have a scenario set up where this and this can't both be true, just logically, it's better that way. 
But just know that if this is true and it executes this code, it won't even look at this question. Because once it dis once it finds something that's true, it skips the rest of the if elif else block. Yes, it will keep going down the list until it runs out of elifs. I could have 30 elifs. I could have 100 elifs. I don't know what the heck kind of program that is. It would be interesting. But you can have as many elifs as you want. And you and and the first one that it first thing that it comes to that is true, it does that code block and then it goes to the end. Then it goes to the next line of code that's not indented. And if it gets all the way to else, then it just does that. You can have if, elif, and no else also. So if you, if by default, if none of these are true, if you just want it to ignore it and move on with its life, you can just leave off the else. Another thing that you want to be careful of is if you have an if, an elif, or an else, you must have a line of code beneath that. Not a comment. You must have a line of code. Otherwise, Python thinks you're kind of dumb because you have a condition with, with no results. So it'll, it will yell at you for that. So you want to have, for every, for every colon, you need to have an indented line of code, at least one. It could be nothing. And there's also some commands that will just be like dummy commands that you could put in here. But it's better just to not have that, honestly. So, um, so yeah, this is what a complex tree might look like. So for your sandbox assignment for today, what I want you to do, and I've put some code up, and I'm going to show you some stuff and just here in a second before I turn you loose on this. But I want you to, to get a number as input from the user. I want you to use the code, which I'm going to give you, to generate a random number that requires the random module from Python. You don't need to worry about how it works or why it works or anything like that right now. Just use the code. And I want you to use if, elif, and else to give feedback to the user as to whether their guess was higher, lower, or exactly right compared to the computer, the computer's secret guess. So it's a number guessing game. And you can have fun with it. You can play around and make a UI, or um, if you want to embellish it in other ways. This is just a thought exercise. It is not due. So you don't have to worry too much about that. But the code, the sample code that I'm going to show you right now is already on the website. So you can download that and start playing around with it. But basically what this code does is it first imports the random module. And it creates a variable like this one using the random modules function called randint and passing it a one and a 10. If I print that out, which I wouldn't want to do in a real guessing game, what you'll see here is that every time I run that, it's going to just spit out a random integer between one and 10. By the way, it's not an integer greater than or less than 10, it's greater than or equal to one, and less than or equal to 10. So it's inclusive of those numbers, just in case you're like a really like technical person and you need to know. Yeah. No, you would, this, this particular function just takes two integers as arguments. So it'll, it'll throw an error. Um, you probably, I mean, you just said the parameters. It's relatively simple. You could write a custom function that would do that, but this one does not. Yeah, it's a, it's a relatively simple function. So you would do that. You would do this, and then you probably want to get input from the user, put that into a variable, and then you're going to use 
comparison operators and an if elif else structure to tell the tell the user your guess was too high, your guess was too low, or you guessed the secret number. So that's that's the challenge. And that's it for today as far as the lecture goes. Do you have any questions? I